So can you tell us about your family upbringing, your parents' professions, and how you became interested in science? Sure. Um, so I'm kind of a person who, almost from the time I was very little, I knew I would be doing something related to medicine and science. And so my history was uh, my parents, both sides, immigrated from Russia mm. in the 1920s. Uh, they were fleeing from the the possibility that uh, my mother's brother would be taken into the Russian army, from which Jews never really got out. They stayed there. For, so the family left. Part of the family went to Montreal, and part of the family went to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And in the group in Montreal started a fruit business, as did the group in Brooklyn. Uh, my mother's brother, my uncle, um, was really the person who inspired us for our future careers. It took him a few years to learn English, and then it took him, he had, he had then there was a time where there was uh, anti-Semitism and in getting into universities. And so he couldn't get into McGill. And he went to the University of Missouri, did very well. When he tried to get into medical school, again, he couldn't get into McGill, but got into Temple and did his training, kind of standard medical training. Uh, his big break was becoming a postdoctoral fellow with a man named Bunnell who was the leading person in the world in hand surgery at UCSF. And my uncle became a hand surgeon and worked on uh, injuries. Was he was very creative. And in fact, he was the first North American physician who was brought to China when Nixon opened up China because he worked on hand injuries. And what he would do is, you know, he was a standard academic. He would go around the world and do his presentations and then intersect with our lives on occasion. Meanwhile, the other side of the family, my, um, my mother and father, uh, had a much more difficult life. They, um, my father, during the Depression, had to drop out of engineering school, and they, started, they bought a chicken farm in New Jersey, the famous Jewish chicken farms yeah. in New Jersey, which were notorious for how unsuccessful they were. <laughs> so my father was working very hard, and my uncle would come in every once in a while and show the wonderful things he was doing. And my mother would say, well, you got a choice here. <laughs> you can either work on the farm or you can become a physician. And my uncle was really a physician scientist of different sorts. He created new surgeries that, uh, that, helped, pe uh, that helped people, basically. He figured out how to do rotations. When, if you lost a thumb, you couldn't do opposition. And he figured out how to... He created a surgery where you could create a thumb out of a finger by rotation, which was very important for industrial industries. And he volunteered at the um, Shriners Hospital and, and that was associated with McGill. By the way, he became head of plastic surgery at McGill uh, in spite of having been rejected. denied entry so many times, but he showed his skills and became head of plastic surgery. <clears throat> and working at Children's Shriner, he figured out how to take deformed jaws and you could take a piece of bone from the leg and give a kid a jaw, basically. So he was really creative as a mm -hmm. clinical in, clinical investigator. And he was our model. And in fact, not only did I go to medical school and followed a physician scientist track, but my brother was younger than myself. He went to medical school and became a leading research clinical educator and was head of the house staff at uh, Charlottesville mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for many years. And my sister became a physician, and uh, she uh, is really a practitioner, but has been head of the hospital in Chattanooga, where she has been practicing. So we were all kind of directed into medicine one way or another, particularly my, I took the, took the medical research to, uh, direction, my brother took the medical education, and my sister mm. took the medical practice based on our, our family history. Wow. It's hereditary. So you received your BS from Brandeis and your MD from Johns Hopkins. So presumably it was during your research fellowships that you became interested in research. So how did those educational experiences lead you to a career in research? Right, yes. So I, at Brandeis, um, I really had a wonderful time learning how to think about science, the scientific method. And during my senior year, I did an honors project with Helen Van Vanakis, who was in the biochemistry department. Brandeis had a very strong biochemistry department. And my project for a senior was a little bit too sophisticated. It was, how does uric acid model RNA? And mm -hmm. I, I did a little bit of work, but I didn't really get turned on to that. And then I went to medical school at Johns Hopkins. And again, I didn't get turned on to really doing research. It was the, instead of having very traditional 
scientific courses where you would learn biochemistry and learn the methods. They basically threw us into a research project. So I had a research project in biochemistry, a research project in microbiology, and without having the real basics, having the background, uh, I really didn't enjoy that very much. And I didn't think I was going to go into science. And it, you were correct. The, the time that I st got more interested in science was when I started my fellowship and was working with uh, my first mentor, Henry Binder, and uh, was very interested in understanding the pathophysiology of diarrheal diseases. And uh, that's how I kind of got into it. But it, in my fellowship, I actually had the time. In those days, mm -hmm. we weren't pushed as much to be for clinical training. And I, I did enough research to realize that I enjoyed it. Following my time at Yale, my fellowship, it was in the Berry Plan. It, it was the time of the Vietnam War. And many of us signed up for something called the Berry Plan. And the Berry mm -hmm. Plan was to allow you to finish your training so that you become a specialist and offer the Army or whatever service center, you, service part of the center you would be in, to um, you know, more of a special, especially. Well, in my case, the training took so long, the Vietnam War ended. Yeah. So um, when it was time to go into the Army, they, I called up, said, where am I going? And they said, oh, we don't need you. But maybe you don't want to just show up. But I mm. figured not showing up to the Army, that might not right. be the smartest thing. So I was at Walter Reed, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And uh, there were a bunch of us uh, in a similar position, young people. And we came under the influence of a man named Sam Formal. And Sam was uh, a wonderful uh, m microbiologist who wanted to understand how diarrheal diseases occurred, what the mechanism was. And so we have started working on that in different models. And that, that's how I kind of, my direction mm -hmm. went from working with Henry Binder, where I was studying ion transport in one way or another, into a, a host pathogen. So that's how, from Brandeis to not thinking science to... Mm. I'm in medical school to not thinking science to Henry really making me think that science would be a good career. Interesting. So you've had academic positions at Yale, at GWU, and the Universe, Uniformed Services, and Tufts. Um, how did some of those experiences contribute to your career? Well, surprisingly, my career was pretty much, in terms of what I did in my career, many of the things you just mentioned, places you mentioned. I've had basically the same career. I've been a clinician. I'm a, I'm a gastroenterologist with a specialty in diarrheal diseases. And I have a few months a year in which I do clinical work, mm -hmm. usually one or two months a year. And the rest of my time is spent in research. At Walter Reed, it, it was basically a laboratory job. But I knew that I was interested in doing both clinical medicine and uh, research, so I volunteered at the George Washington when I was, where I was made an assistant professor, and I would make rounds with the fellows. Mm. And in those days, the clinical aspect of Walter Reed really didn't have much uh, interactions with science. They were more, much more clinically oriented. But they allowed some of us to come over and spend a month as attendings. And they took away from that, hey, these, these scientific guys actually mm. know some things that can contribute. And we took away in wonderful interactions. And I must credit Larry Johnson, who was then head of GI at Walter Reed, uh, for opening up the uh, experience to, to accepting that uh, people who are doing science could take part in clinical, gastro in clinical gastroenterology. Um, the, I guess, did you ask about Tufts in that? Yeah. Okay, so when, after completing my time in the Army, it was time to get a job. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very fortunate, and I, I, at Walter Reed we were doing research and presenting our work, and I think I presented at a clinical meeting, the American Federation of Clinical Research it was called in those days, and people from Tufts heard my talk, Andrew Plout heard my talk, and invited me to come and interview for a job at Tufts. And I, that was the job that I ultimately accepted. And it was exactly the same job, a month or two of <laughs> clinical, and mostly doing, doing research. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the, it, was, it was a division that Marshall Kaplan, who's a hepatologist, ran. And Marshall was not really a researcher, but he, he respected everybody's contribution to the division. And they had clinicians such as uh, Kareem Fawaz and investigators such as Andrew Plout and myself. And we were all respected and we had a wonderful time interacting with each other. Uh, during that time, I had the biggest, um, I guess, good luck that has mark marked my career. The, the, uh, at the end of my first year at Tufts, uh, a man named Jeff Sharp came to be head of physiology at Tufts. Jeff had been part of the Mass General uh, Department of Medicine. 
and he was he basically helped discover the fact that in cholera toxin you elevate the cyclic AMP system and that causes the the, uh, the, the components the, the downstream signaling that you see. And Jeff and I became close friends, and he became a very important mentor. He taught me how, really how to do much much more sophisticated science. I had learned from Henry Binder how to study ion transport, and uh, and that was I mean I think I learned from Henry how to do that at a pretty sophisticated level. Mm -hmm. While I was at Yale, I took a course on, um, on ion transport with a man named Peter Curran, who was one of the giants of the field. And then with Henry, we were started studying models in which we would uh, create diarrheal disease models in animals and l learned how to study active ion transport. Uh, when I got to Tufts, well, I guess in the Army, I continued that kind of study, um, but made it more related to host pathogen studies. But when I got to Tufts, starting to work with Jeff Sharp, I learned much more about biochemical uh, uh, techniques, and uh, he made a huge difference. I mean, he was a very positive influence, um, always being optimistic, always being critical, teaching me that the way you deal with um, taking part in an academic career is being willing to present your work, have it criticized, mm -hmm. don't take it personally, and try to make your studies as, as good as you possibly can. And uh, all, and don't give up ever. Mm. And uh, that, to me, that was the, probably the biggest influence in my academic career, coming in contact with Jeff. He and I have been uh, friends now for more than 35 years, and we actually spent 25 years as collaborators. Wow. So one of the things that you did while you were at Tufts was take a sabbatical with Ernesto Carafoli and Heine Muir. What was the focus of your sabbatical, and what role do you think that sabbaticals play for people who are pursuing research careers? Yeah. Well, sabbaticals are a real wonderful boon of having, uh, being in an academic career. I mean, you can use them for many different things. Um, I, what I have done, I've taken several sabbaticals. The first was in 1984 with uh, Ernesto Carapoli and Heine Moore. Um, I, I didn't pick a terrible place to go, Zurich. Was, uh, <laughs> and my family was very happy going there. And uh, my kids learned to ski and <laughs> became really good skiers. That was part of the deal. My wife said should go if we uh, if uh, if we would ski every weekend. So I, we, we we agreed to do that. Um, I learned from Ernesto. I started out in his laboratory, and I learned more about calcium biochemistry. He was uh, he was really one of the of the pioneers of the calcium ATPases, and I learned really how to how to measure calcium and how to in integrate si calcium signaling in, in my studies. I turned out that I realized that after I was there a month or two, I realized that I was uh, very interested in what Heine Murr was doing, and Heine uh, was really the person that had developed vesicle technology, mm -hmm. and he was in the head of physiology at the University of, of Zurich. And he allowed me to, and, and Ernesto allowed me to then transfer most of my time to work with Heine. So I learned how to do vesicle technology. So what I've learned how to do animal studies in Wissing Chamber, active ion transport from Henry Binder, I then learned how to do uh, both calcium biochemistry and vesicle transport from Heine Moore. And so I used the opportunity to make my transport studies even more sophisticated. And one of the things I think people can do on a sabbatical is pick out the technology, the areas that they want to go into, and pick the best person in the world and go and learn from them. Mm -hmm. And I felt very fortunate to learn that. It was very, very happenstance. Uh, an event happened while I was in Heine Murrah's laboratory. Uh, a man came with a tiny piece of tissue from a child who had congenital diarrhea. Mm. And we studied that. Heine is the one who described sodium hydrogen exchange, uh, one of the first people to describe it, particularly in a vesicle te technology. And we studied this kid's biopsy, and there was no sodium hydrogen exchange. Turns out that this was a, the first description of a congenital sodium diarrhea that was related to poor function of the sodium hydrogen exchanger. And I presumably we'll mm. talk later about what I've contributed, but it turns out that we solved the molecular mechanism of that uh, 30 years later. Wow. Wow, so interesting. So then in 1988, you came back to Johns Hopkins University where you were a professor of medicine and physiology, as well as the director of basic research in the GI division. What was your charge when you returned to Hopkins and what do you feel as though you've accomplished? Right. So actually, I came back as chief of gastroenterology. And uh, in 1988, uh, I was hired. 
by Jack Stobo. And Hopkins, of course, is a spectacular, world-class institution. And it had always been very strong clinically and clinical research. But it, in fact, at that point, Hopkins had not transitioned to a, uh, a, the Department of Medicine to an to a institution in which there was strong molecular and cell biology. And Jack Stobo was hired as head of medicine to bring molecular and cell biology uh, to that institution. And I was hired to, as chief of gastroenterology to do just that. I was given a certain startup package. Uh, by today's standards, it would be considered trivial, $3 million. <laughs> but I was given a bunch of an opportunity to hire multiple faculty, and I had lots of space. And my charge was to build a division and make it strong scientifically and not to disrupt the very strong clinical basis. Mm -hmm. And in fact, because of the timing I, I came there, I was able to, I, I was the one that brought liver transplant to the GI division mm. and also started therapeutic endoscopy. And uh, it was the time where things were changing clinically. So I had an opportunity to make multiple, uh, multiple changes. With that money, I was able to hire wonderful scientists and we built a very strong basic research uh, division. Uh, and it was based on the concept that um, if you got people who had different areas of expertise but like, were willing to and liked working together, you could obtain large grants that would allow you to get f uh, funding. And my, my philosophy was that um, if you are forced into the same room with people for a reason, and one of the reasons would be that you're getting the same support, that people would work together and the intellectual base would become much stronger. Mm -hmm. And that was that's really what I brought, one of the things I brought to Hopkins very early on. So you, you did talk a little bit about your role in fostering group science. Um, what role did some of those large projects play in advancing the goals of your own research program? Right, well, that's a good question. Well, let me just describe what I've done with these kind of, the kind, the kind of projects that I've started to bring people together. Well, I was a tough, um, the one thing I did was to begin a GI core center. The NIH, the NIDDK, ex decided to expand these large GI centers, and we applied for one, and um, I, as I was the PI, and uh, the head of medicine at Tufts was named Sheldon Wolf. And uh, Shelley was a wonderful head. He was actually the head of NIAID prior to Anthony, uh, Tony Fauci. And he was a magnificent person who, who had an ego that could take pride in what the people he hired did. Mm. And he loved to talk about everybody's, all the people he hires, accomplishments. And he, and he brought in a huge number of outstanding scientists, Charlie Dinarello, uh, Keith McAdam, Mark Klempner, Jerry Kirsch, just wonderful scientists. And we formed a group and we talked about science continually. And when the opportunity to form a large GI center came up, we jumped at it and applied for it. And I was able to uh, convince the different faculty members I had hired uh, to take part in it. And we got funded right away. It was a center called GRASP. This was called the Center for GI Research on Absorptive and Secretory Processes. And it was wonderful. It was the first opportunity I had to lead something. And I created an opportunity where people would interact scientifically. So when I went to Hopkins, I said, oh, this is a great model. Mm. And uh, in fact, at Hopkins, we've applied for a GI center like that. We had a small one initially for eight years, and now we've had a large GI core center for, <clears throat> for seven years. And it's really the intellectual basis of the Center for GI Research at Hopkins. It's half basic scientists and half clinical investigators. And we get together and we you know, talk about the different advances in science going on. And, uh, we, uh, and the, it's a core center, so it offers proteomics mm -hmm. and imaging and uh, enteroids and uh, translational, help doing translational research. It brings people together as research occur. I've also been lucky enough to be the PI of three program project grants where people get together. It was initially, it was uh, my friend Joe Handler, who was head of nephrology, and myself formed the first one, and then we had other ones. And uh, I've always been lucky at Hopkins to be able to have basic scientists interested in enough in the work to take part. Mm -hmm. And I had a partner named Ann Hubbard, who was a wonderful cell biologist, and she and I ran these program project grants, from, as well as a center grant for, for a bunch of years. For my own work, it, it's definitely profited by having the intellectual, a lot of smart people taking part in it and giving us the equipment. Normally, a single laboratory can't really buy very expensive mm -hmm. equipment, 
and uh, the, the core center has always been able to provide some of that equipment. So we've been able to do advanced imaging using confocal and, two, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, more sophisticated microscopes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. During your career, you have managed to be well-funded by the NIH, and you have published over 300 papers. Can you tell us how you have maintained a successful research career while also serving as an attending physician at Hopkins? Right, that's a tough question. <laughs> so there are all kinds of answers to that. Certainly hard work. I mean, I spend most of my time you know, reading and uh, I've, I've sacrificed being involved with a lot of other interesting activities. Uh, uh, luckily, my wife has been supportive for that and uh, she, was, uh, she has taken part in lots of interesting activities and uh, has in, in allowed me to take part at, at a peripheral level rather than spending as much time. So time was really one, one really important part. The other part, I guess, was uh, what Jeff Sharp ta taught me, is that uh, if you think your science is good and you present it to peer your peers locally or wherever, and you are supported in that the ideas are good and the techniques are solid, then you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to keep going after the grants and you'll be turned down, everybody gets turned down, but you have to have a thick skin enough to say, okay, you know, here are the corrections, that, here, here are some flaws that were found by the reviewers. Let's fix them up and let's go back because we believe that our basic findings are, are solid. So persistence, having a, being willing to accept criticism, I think mm -hmm. has allowed, have allowed me to uh, survive within, in this system. It's a tough system for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So according to your CV, you are a part owner of Transmembrane, a company holding an NA. HE3 gene patent. Can you tell us about the company and what it is seeking to do with the patent? Right. Um, so Transmembrane was a company. It's now closed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when we cloned, so one of the, when I went to Hopkins, one of the first things we did was to clone the sodium hydrogen exchanger gene family. Uh, we, we were the ones that uh, had cloned the epithelial isoforms and we thought that might have some commercial value. So we, uh, we patented that. Hopkins at that point was not really into patenting, patenting things. So I was lucky enough to find a commercial partner who patented that and, and then gave us back the patent. Mm -hmm. So this allowed us to um, interact with different pharmaceutical companies uh, as they tried to use these, uh, the, the genes that we had uh, cloned uh, to develop drugs for, for treating for treating sodium hydrogen exchange. Mm -hmm. Turns out that constipation or diarrhea, and now it turns out phosphate absorption are all related to the sodium hydrogen exchanger. And through this patent, through this company, which was the patent basically, we were able to interact with different pharmaceutical companies. One thing for sure we didn't do was become rich. <laughs> <laughs> so is that still being pursued as a therapeutic avenue? Yeah, so um, we, we stopped that we stopped the company because the patent was going to expire. Uh, companies, particularly a company called Ardelix, uh, has used some of the techniques that we developed <clears throat> and developed a drug that blocks sodium absorption when taken orally, does not get absorbed, so there's no side of, there's no systemic side mm. effects. And they're trying to see if it, it works for constipation, which it seems to do. It had the potential to work for hypertension because mm. if you lose the amount of sodium absorption by the gut, lower it, then the total body sodium gotcha. would, uh, content would be lower and that would be a therapy for hypertension. That does not appear to be, not, does mm. not appear to be a very successful direction given the fact that Americans eat so much salt. Oh, goodness. <laughs> However, they discovered along the way that uh, the, the sodium hydrogen exchanger 3, NH3, uh, also when blocked, prevents phosphate absorption, appears to be via paracellular pathway. And um, that could be very important because people with renal disease, uh, renal failure, have retained phosphate. And there is no real good way to get that phosphate mm -hmm. out of them right now. The oral therapies are very nauseating. They're nauseating. nauseating. And so this potentially this could be a very important uh, addition clinically. Interesting. So, as noted, you've had a long career with an active research program. Can you tell us how your research area of expertise developed and who were the people who influenced your career? Sure. So, I got into gastroenterology early on. So, when I was um, in medical school in a long time ago, <laughs> the uh, it was, it was pretty standard after the second year of medical school to do pathology. 
And so I was dating my wife, who was in New York, and I was in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins, and I wanted to do pathology at Hopkins, so I invited my wife to come to Baltimore, and she said, coming to Baltimore without being married, not a chance. <laughs> so I went to New York. And what I did in New York is I worked in the pathology department at Mount Sinai. And the head of pathology was a man named Hans Popper. Hans Popper actually started the field of hepatology. Oh. Until there was Hans Popper, it was kind of, you know, kind of nondescript. But I, that summer that I was there, I guess it was six months I was there, because Hopkins used to give you what was called a free quarter. And he basically had six months to, uh, to specialize in something. And he would go around New York City and give lectures on these yellow, very funny yellow slides of hepatology. Huh. And I went around and I met all the major GI players in, in New York City. Uh, such a, yeah. And uh, Popper took an interest in what I was doing. He thought that the kind of work that I was doing, you know, just doing pathology and, and working up cases, he said that I was doing a good job. And it was the first time that I was complimented in mm. medical school. <laughs> and I came to the conclusion that if this field was uh, if uh, it was good enough to make uh, me feel good about myself doing it, then it might be a field worth pursuing. And when I returned to Hopkins, I did a rotation with Tom Hendricks and Ted Bayless, who were then the, the uh, heads and co-heads of gastroenterology at Hopkins. I loved it. And uh, I made my decision that I would pick that field and never look back. I've been, it was never a decision that I felt was uh, at all challenging. I thought it was a great decision. I've, I've loved gastroenterology ever since. <clears throat> In terms of the people who influenced my career, other than Hans Popper and Tom Hendricks, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my fellowship, I worked with, I went to Yale for my fellowship, mm -hmm. <coughs> working with uh, Howard Spiro, who was the head of the whole division, who was a wonderful character, a most brilliant, wonderful guy, who was really a leader in gastroenterology, first wrote the first textbook in GI, and with Henry Binder. Henry Binder was a person studying ion transport, really very solid, charismatic, charismatic scientist. And he took an interest in what I was doing. I worked for him. And it was kind of interesting. He clearly was my first mentor. Uh, I was disappointed when I finished my fellowship that I had to go in the Army, as I mentioned. Mm. It's a very planned thing. And when I left Yale and went to Walter Reed, um, it, it was not that easy to, to decide how to develop my own laboratory. And Henry had been an excellent mentor for me while I was with him. But he, and as, I was, as I was struggling, he, you know, he kind of dropped out of sight for a while. He, I, when I called him and asked for advice, he would give me his you know, wonderful advice. Uh, but it took me a few years to get on my feet and start achieving science, making the important scientific findings again, at which time Henry became totally involved again. Mm -hmm. It's a good example that in a mentor-mentee relationship, the mentee has got to actually offer something to the mm -hmm. mentor. It's just, it can't be just a one-way street. And Henry's been a friend and an important part of my uh, support system uh, forever. He's still, he still advises me a great deal. So working with Henry was very important. As I mentioned, at Tufts, Jeff Sharp uh, was really the person who guided my career, I think, the most. And I give him the most credit for my success. Not only did he teach me about science, but over the years, uh, he has been a remarkably good advisor. As I built a, a GI core center or a program project grant, there's an administrative component to that. And in terms of plotting out how to go about building that, uh, I always counted on Jeff for very solid advice. And uh, uh, I, I must I give him credit for, I give him a lot of credit for my success for sure. Mm. At, at Hopkins, um, I wouldn't say these have been mentors, but my collab I've, I've had partners who helped me develop the scientific directions. Uh, I mentioned Joe Handler, who was, uh, had been at the NIH for most of his career, came into Hopkins as head of nephrology, and he and I together shared a lot of the research projects that we, we did, and, uh, and particularly building the multiple, uh, multiple science groups uh, projects. Um, Ann Hubbard was a very wonderful uh, component of our, of our group, very critical scientist, never let you get away with anything. Uh, she told you how it was, and uh, it was really valuable to have a person like that. And currently, I have a similar par partner. Anne's retired. But Svenlana Lusenko, who's a professor of physiology, is t has taken up exactly that role. She's a very solid scientist, uh, very critical, very helpful, mm -hmm. and a real partner in what we're trying to develop. So what do you consider to be your most significant contribution to physiology and gastroenterology? 
Right, right, right. So I've always studied intestinal sodium absorption. Um, I st studied it at many different levels. So at Yale, where I really started these studies, we learned, I learned how to do ion transport in intact animals and active ion transport using the Usung chamber voltage clamp technique. And we did more descriptive science. We, did, we found that different hormones acted through elevating intracellular calcium. We found that, that different laxatives worked by changing ion transport in, in the gut. And it was, so I, I was really a descriptive scientist. Uh, one of the reasons I took the job at Hopkins as head of uh, the GI division was, was uh, I was convinced, um, no, I guess I'm skipping. I, I should go back to then what happened after I left, uh, after I, I uh, left Henry Bender. In the Army, I got interested through Sam Formal in host pathogen interactions. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in different diarrheal diseases, but we were still studying it at an ion transport level, not really... Um, getting into the mechanisms mm -hmm. beyond some pretty rudimentary biochemical studies. So I consider that the first period of, of my co scientific contributions. We made contributions, but they were more descriptive and to told you how laxatives worked, how hormones worked through intracellular signaling. Uh, when, we got, when I got to Hopkins, and again, one of the reasons that I took the job, the head of medicine told me I, that I would make my scientific, the, the sophistication of my scientific studies more better by being there in that kind of a scientific environment. And um, I think he was right. So while I was at Tufts, yeah, so the next part after the Army when we, we did the description, uh, we started merging our stuff into more biochemical studies, trying to understand the signal transduction that regulated ion transport. And I consider that kind of the second phase of our, of our studies. And there, Jeff Sharp and I did pretty, pretty wonderful studies. Turns out that the insulin secretion by the beta cell, the signal transduction is surprisingly similar to the intestine. Hmm. And we did parallel studies, and I learned a lot of biochemical studies from, from, from Jeff. At the same time, when I started this GI core center at Tufts, I was very fortunate to have an advisory board that included Harvey Lodish. And Harvey is a professor from the Whitehead. And Harvey took an interest in our work and started mentoring us on how to begin doing molecular studies, mm -hmm. trying to understand what protein, what, the, what was the basis of the sodium absorptive process. We knew that it was acting like a sodium hydrogen exchange, but we really didn't know the protein. And when I got to Hopkins, uh, using the advice from Harvey Lodish, and, and we decided to clone this, pro, this gene family. And again, this was a kind of a lucky thing. So when you're asking about my contributions, the, the contribution was we're the ones that cloned the sodium hydrogen exchanger gene family. And the way that happened was, again, good luck. Uh, Jeff Sharp was on sabbatical in Nice, working in an institution in which Jacques Pusiger uh, was working. And Jacques, at, during that time, had just cloned the first mammalian sodium hydrogen exchanger. And he used a very difficult technique in which he worked out a technique to remove sodium hydrogen exchange from a cell line, and then put pieces of RNA in to reconstitute it. And eventually, through a painstaking method, discovered the first sodium hydrogen exchanger named NHE1. Uh, Jeff Sharp convinced uh, Jacques Pusiger to interact with us, to collaborate with us, and we started using some of the probes that he had discovered mm -hmm. to look for the other sodium hydrogen exchangers, the epithelial ones. So when I was at Hopkins, we started doing this and looking at particularly in rabbit. And we're very, uh, we thought we had had a big hit, but it turns out we cloned the rabbit in HE1, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, we, it was good. It was uh, first time it was, yeah. it was cloned, but it didn't get us the epithelial isoforms. But then we got, we developed a, um, a strategy in which we would use different uh, levels of, uh, of stringency, low stringency screening, and we're able to clone the sodium hydrogen exchanger two and then sodium hydrogen exchanger three, and which were turned out to be the major epithelial sodium hydrogen exchangers. And uh, that led to kind of the second period or third period in our <laughs> so study of sodium uh, absorption, in which we did structure function studies and you know, distorted the protein, mutated it, discovered uh, that the pro how the protein was regulated and uh, did structure function studies. And this was really exciting because uh, you, you could mutate the protein and discover things about it. And we discovered that there's a very large C-terminus that's entirely critical for regulation. Mm -hmm. We saw that uh, evolutionarily uh, bacteria 
had sodium hydrogen exchangers, but they didn't have any C-terminus, a tiny itsy-bitsy C-terminus. And where evolution had added, it added this very complicated C-terminus, did all the regulation. And then we discovered that the way this regulation occurred were by these big multi-protein multi complexes that formed on the C-terminus that would change the conformation of the C-terminus and change the, the regulation. So that was the third component. And then we felt we made a significant contribution to understanding sodium hydrogen exchange. And uh, at, during this period, we were looking at what diseases had abnormal sodium hydrogen exchange. Discovered virtually all diarrheal diseases had different sodium hydrogen exchangers, and came to the conclusion. And we're one of the major people that came to the conclusion that in diarrheal diseases, the one transport abnormality that almost uniformly occurs is inhibition of sodium hydrogen exchange, mm -hmm. meaning it would be a darn good uh, drug target if you're going to treat diarrhea. Same time, work, uh, other people, including but our contribution also, discovered that CFTR, which was the chloride secretory protein, uh, while it was increased in certain diarrheas like cholera, different enterotoxigenic diarrheal diseases, in inflammatory diarrheal diseases was in fact turned down. So that not only was NHV3 important in the enterotoxigenic diarrheas, but it was the Abnorm abnormality in the, in the inflammatory diarrheal diseases. So again, we were kind of involved with uh, using our physiologic studies translationally to understand mm -hmm. the disease. So that's kind of the third phase that we contributed. And then an another good break happened in which I was asked to run a meeting at the NIH in 2010 asking the question, what are the needs what needs do you have scientifically to allow you to develop drugs for treating diarrhea? Because there really are no good drugs for treating diarrhea. Diarrheal diseases are, were, when I first got to Hopkins in, in 88, there were 12 million children dying a year of diarrhea. It's decreased to half a million now because of oral rehydration solution, but there's no drug that uh, is particularly good. And uh, the, meeting, the purpose of that meeting was saying, what do we need to do to develop drug therapy for diarrhea, and what the conclusion was that we, we didn't really have any human models. We had cancer cell line models, we had mouse intestinal models, or rabbit intestine, but we didn't really have any human models. And at that meeting, Hugo de Yonga, who was a longtime friend and collaborator from Rotterdam in the biochemistry department there, he reported on the human enteroids, or organoids, mm -hmm. that Hans Klevers had just really, uh, the, really published the first papers on. And at that meeting, I was sitting next to Mary Estes, and when we heard the presentation by De Young, we said, looked at each other and said, we got to do this. And in fact, uh, at that point, we, she and I worked together and applied for grants, got funding from the NCATS, the first grants from the NCATS, and developed enteroid models uh, that allowed us to have normal human intestine on chips or in transwells in which we could duplicate normal, hum, uh, normal in human intestinal physiology and use that for pathophysiology as well as uh, drug development. And so that was, and, and we have used that to model host pathogens for drug development, for understanding signal transduction, and that's really the current state, that, that's I guess the fifth phase mm. of my contribution to, uh, to studying uh, so intestinal sodium absorption, which I consider my major contribution. It's interesting, and listening to you tell that story, it makes me think of the things we think of in physiology with starting out with more descriptive studies and then moving through the more molecular examinations of things. And then it kind of comes full circle in the development of this model that you've been talking about where you can place some of your other findings back into context. Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. So, you, know, you know, as a gastroenterologist, even though I was so immersed in the molecular studies, I always felt that, how do I get this to a disease? Right. And it was really wonderful, the fact that now with these enteroids, we're able to take our molecular models and apply them to human disease. It's definitely a, a wonderful thing at this stage of my career. So tell us about your first APS meeting and how did it differ from the current meeting that we're at? Well, that's a... <laughs> that requires me to remember my first <laughs> APS meeting. So in, in the late 70s, um, the, the GI part of the APS uh, was not as separated into different segments, ion transport or motility. Or, it was really one big gamish. And uh, so the meeting was really more general GI than, than more general GI science than it is as specifically now. Now, mm -hmm. the epithelial transport guys are in one group, the motility groups are in another group, the signal transduction people, they're all separate. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I think that's the biggest biggest difference. Um, you're probably aware that the digestive diseases meeting meets very similarly in time, very close to the APS. And there's always been a bit of a competition. Where would the best science be presented and where are the more, more of the people going to attend? And uh, in those days, um, the digestive disease, I think, had many more attendees. And uh, there was a push in, in the digestive disease meeting. There's always a bit of a competition between clinical studies and basic science studies. And over the years, it's gone back and forth. Is, is more basic science being presented? Is more clinical science? And I think when I first started, it was um, that there was, was always a feeling that there wasn't enough basic science. And there was some consideration whether the, you know, all the basic scientists should shift over to the physiology society. And that's gone back and forth. Mm -hmm. And as, I, as I'm here today, that's still going on, trying to figure out where's the best place to get as many basic scientists in a room with clinicians to talk about the science, to share ideas. And it's not clear where, I mean, it's clear that there's, right now, the Physiology Society, this meeting has a lot of people attending, a lot of GI people. And it's, it's still not clear where, you know, which, what's, the best, what's the best venue to allow GI science to move forward. So you've also been an active member in, in some other societies. And can you tell us what role society membership and participation has played in your career? Sure. So when I was going to the, when, at the time, I'm trying to think when, in the, in the mid 18, 1980s, I guess, I was uh, elected to serve on the steering committee of the GI section of the APS. And at the same time, I was quite active in the, in the American Gastroenterological Association. And, uh, you can, and I was taking part in both. But I, I, got, I guess I was, um, I moved up, I guess, more quickly in the, in the American Gastroenterological Association. I was on, I was head of a part of their uh, research policy, giving out their pilot projects, or what it was called then, the Scholar Awards, uh, which were to young, develop, young Faculty Development Awards, which really allowed young people to get their research careers started. Then I became head of their public policy committee, mm -hmm. and then I was elected to their governing board, and I moved up through that as, as, president, as vice president, president-elect, president, and then post-president, where you're president of the, uh, another component of the, mm. of the American Gastroenterological Association. So um, my activities were more in the AGA than they have been from the political part of the Physiology Society. Luckily, I joined your committee as on their public policy committee, which was a mm -hmm. wonderful experience, and I felt that I could use my the experience I got from the American Gastroenterological Association and taking part. But taking part in the societies, both the APS and the GI and the American Gastroenterological, is a wonderful experience. I mean, at your local institution, you're worried, you're you're trying to interact with different components locally, but there's a, a national issues mm -hmm. that your that your society your specialty deals with and this is an opportunity to weigh in and have some influence on what you think is important directions for your whatever area you're working in in my case gastroenterology mm -hmm. and uh, it was a wonderful experience uh, in the AGA so building on that and the narrative about your career you wrote that you've been active in the mentorship of young researchers and advocacy for the gastroenterology specialty can you tell us about those elements of your career and how they've played out Sure. Well, mentoring has always been a critical part of what I've tried to do. And um, when I was at Tufts, it was uh, I w the people I would mentor, of course, would be the GI fellows. And I was very fortunate to have GI fellows coming through my laboratory. And uh, not all, many of them did not end up being uh, basic scientists, but they, they were wonderful people who really gave a real attempt during the time they were in the laboratory. They learned how to, the value of science, and they went on to wonderful careers. I mean, people like Grace Elta, who was, turned out to be head, clinical head at the University of Michigan. Uh, we had a wonderful time working together, and she and I have been close friends ever since, one of the real benefits of being a, of being a mentor. At Hopkins, uh, mentorship took a lot of different levels. I mean, I was given a chance to develop faculty members, mm -hmm. so when I hired faculty, my job was to not only hire them, but make sure that they were successful, and, and I did that by trying to mentor them. I did that two ways, of course, by listening, trying to understand what they were trying to achieve, but also trying to keep enough money from my startup package so that when they ran into troubles with funding, I, I, I would never let them realize that, you know, that their careers could be in danger and make sure they had enough money for them 
for their salaries and for their laboratories, and uh, that was an important portion. And I, one of the most wonderful things about this aspect of my career was looking to what happened. I mean, Chip Montrose, who's an mm -hmm. important member of the Physiology Society, is a dean at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Vince Yang is now head of medicine at Stony Brook. Um, Alistair Watson is head of a major research, uh, a major medical school, uh, Met Department of Medicine in England. And people have done, Chris Yun is a professor of physi uh, physiology and medicine. You know, people have done great, and uh, I take great pride in realizing that many of them can do better science than I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that's been wonderful. So that, that was part of mentoring. Then there was, so that's mentoring at the faculty level. Then there was mentoring at the fellow level and trying to uh, convince people that um, an, an, an academic career is something that is, they should at least consider. Not every, it's not for everybody, but people that have the abilities and, and the interests, that's something that try to encourage them. And I've been head of the, uh, the way you, you train people in, in a department of medicine is what's called a T32, the mm -hmm. training grants. I've been head of that training grant for 30 years at Hopkins, and we've trained some wonderful people who are leaders in medicine and gastroenterology at this point through that training pro process. And I've taken pride in organizing a fellowship committee for each person in which the fellows tell you what they're doing once or twice a year, and you hear the, what their progress scientifically. It's not only it's their mentors and co-mentors, but also at Hopkins we get other scientists who are interested in the area, get them to listen, and try to make advice about their science, about what grants they should apply for, where they should submit their manuscripts, and what kind of careers they should develop. So that's been an important component of our, of our mentoring uh, as well. And then when the fellows decide that they want to have an investigative career, trying to help them figure out when it's time to apply for grants and mm -hmm. getting them into an environment where they're going to get an, enough time protection, because that's really that's the critical, the pr critical thing. So um, that's, that's been a big part of what I've tried to do for, as a part of my mentoring. So then what advice would you give to students who are starting out in science today? Right. Well, it's not an easy time in science today because uh, it's so competitive to get funding. It's so competitive that um, it, it, it makes you worry that, uh, that it, it's fair to get people to try to go into science. Mm -hmm. Science is thriving. The, you know, every, you, when you read articles about what's being accomplished scientifically, it's really, it becomes more and more sophisticated, more and more cutting edge. It's, re it's remarkable. But it's so competitive that for what people have to think long and hard whether it's a career that they can, they should go into. And I, I always tell people who are considering that, you've got to decide how hard you want to work because if you don't work really hard, people are going to, you're, you're not going to make it. Most people have to work exceptionally hard to be competitive. You have to decide how much money you want to make. Gastroenterologists generally make quite a bit of money and you don't get paid a lot less than that when you are in academics. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide what you and your spouse have to decide how much money you feel you need to have a secure and you know, fa a secure family. So I tell people they need to do that. And then the ones that look like they want to have an academic career, I tell them that they need to um, have a thick skin. You need to apply, present your work. You have to be persistent. You're going to get ripped apart and told your ideas are terrible mm -hmm. because new ideas are always said to be terrible. And, and you need to have a thick skin and be willing to accept criticism. And you have to be persistent. You have to. Um, have faith in yourself and you have to have a group of people advising you that can help you decide if your work is solid enough to go on with it. And if you are, you have to be persistent and be willing to keep coming back multiple times. The other advice I give people, um, young faculty members, is that when you apply for a faculty job, you've got to make sure that the job that the person's hiring you for is the job you want to do. I mean, if you want to do research and they say, oh, we'll let you do 20% research, but we really want you to be mm -hmm. in charge of this motility clinic, then it's not going to work. The person who's hiring you is going to be defining uh, your success in many ways. And if it's a different job than what you're interested in doing, it, it's the wrong job for you. So make sure that you're, there's a match between what you're interested in doing and what the job you're being offered. Interesting. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Well, I just, I've had a wonderful career. I don't think it's over. <laughs> I'm still, still funded, still got lots of interesting questions. This doesn't have to be the end of anything. Right. <laughs> so I'm still pretty, very active. Uh, I think I've been lucky. And I think, you know, we all try to, early on in life, think that uh, the reason we're doing well is entirely because of us. 
but I think I've been, as I look back on it, I mean, there's many areas that, uh, of, of luck that have played a role. Probably the most important thing that happened to me luck-wise was my wife. I, I happened to marry a woman who was supportive and uh, believed in my career and allowed me to work at harder probably than, uh, uh, than a lot of people would work and still was able to provide a wonderful family. My kids are very successful, very happy with their lives, and uh, we're, we're very involved with their lives, and uh, my wife really is responsible for that. So that was one piece of luck, mm -hmm. and we're now married 50 years, and uh, still, still going on. And then I've been lucky to uh, have the mentors. I mean, uh, Henry Binder was a wonderful mentor, supported me tremendously, and has been a lifelong friend and uh, helped me many times during my career. And uh, one of the thrills I've had is that I've been able to actually reciprocate in some ways and help Henry during uh, different parts of, of his career. Jeff Sharp and I have been friends, and, uh, and, and he's been exceptionally important for my career and continues to be that way, even though he's now 89 years old. Mm. still count on him for advice, and, uh, and uh, he's been a tremendous help. And I've been lucky at Hopkins to have found wonderful associates who uh, have worked well together over the years and helped us create an environment in which science is well respected and is able to take part. So I think it's all luck, right? Any one of those, I could have picked the wrong, well, picked the wrong wife, that would have been a disaster. <laughs> picked the wrong place to go, mm -hmm. I could have gone to Tufts, going to Tufts was a wonderful decision. It was a wonderful environment there with uh, being part of something exciting that Shelley Wolf was building. Uh, going into the Army, it could have been sent someplace else, turned out to be a wonderful environment that gave me an area, direction to my research that I've had forever. Deciding to go to Hopkins and giving me the chance to get into molecular studies was a huge, you know, also luck. And uh, so far, it's been a question of uh, I've been very lucky as well as, uh, yeah, I've been very lucky. Well, thank you so much for participating in the Society's Living History Program. And it was a really enjoyable opportunity to learn about your career. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for doing it. It's always a pleasure dealing with you. As with you. <laughs>